Good evening again and welcome to this, the Tuesday, January 21st, 2020, Sovereign Select Board meeting, which I now call to order. The next item is to approve the agenda. I'm going to make one suggestion, which is we, we flip-plop 13 and 12, that is, uh, take up the wastewater allocation for a single-family home before we do the uh, executive session on town manager's performance evaluation. Okay. Is there a, a motion to the, to the effect? Move to approve the agenda as amended. Jamie moves. I'll second. Mike seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Mary will not be joining us t this evening. The next item is to approve minute, minutes of the meetings of the January 7 and January 14, 2020 minutes uh, <laughs> meetings. Is there a motion to the, ef the effect well, of approving else. January 7? So moved. Jamie Second. moves. Second. Colleen seconds. I've got one brief comment, Lee, which is, uh, we're going to reach. Uh, it, it seems to me that it's sensible to refer to council as small c when we do, but when it's town attorney, it should be town attorney. Noted. Hearing no further discussion, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. January 14 minutes. Move to approve the Second. January 14th, 2020 minutes. Jamie moves approval. Colleen seconds. You know, could I ask, just add one thing. When we do the minutes, can you ask whoever types them up to just number the pages? Because if we did have to make any comments, then we'd have to, like, flip through them. They were doing it like that. Well, yeah, the, for these m meetings, I've been doing them because of the rapid turnaround week mm -hmm. after week. Uh -huh. But, mm -hmm. yes, good, okay. good suggestion. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The next item are public comments. Would anyone like to make a public comment? Hearing none, seeing no hands. The next item are select board comments. Colleen? Nope. Mike? No. Jamie? No comments tonight. The one brief one I have is to uh, express our appreciation to Lee for the production of these minutes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. That's not an easy job, certainly not an easy job when you're a participant. Uh, you're welcome. I thought, the, I thought they read uh, smooth, you know, quite smoothly, and I thought you were uh, you know, not only judicious, but uh, uh, I thought the, 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 what you chose to highlight was... Uh, was, was very useful in terms of anybody later on, a year from now, reading and wondering what went on. Good. So, good job. Next item is the town manager report. Well, I'll be brief as well. Work has, has been ongoing on the budget, trying to bring that in to a point where it's acceptable and defensible. And then working on the stormwater presentation for tonight and other current matters, so. Keeping the, <coughs> trying to keep the train moving forward. It's a good thing. Thank you. Each of us might have mentioned January 25th is the Winter Carnival. Ah, yes. Everybody get ready for it. We, we, we prepared by uh, arranging for cold weather and snow, so should be appropriate. <laughs> Next item is to consider waiver of penalty for late payment of property taxes. This was an item... Uh, table from the last meeting for reasons of uh, technology glitches, and we're going to Can retry. To work tonight. Lee Crone at the select board meeting. Mr. Joseph. Hi, Mr. Crone. How are you? So we are here in a public meeting to take up your request with the select board and you're on speakerphone thank, thank, for everyone's benefit. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, and good evening to everyone. Um, is it okay if I'm in my office right now? May I? Uh, this will take, I think, about 15 seconds or so. Okay to patch in my wife, Anne, who's at home? Yes. This is Jerry Story okay. chairing the meeting. Welcome and hello, and by all means, let us know when you're all set. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, and I will patch her in right now. I know she's on standby. Hello, this is uh, Charlie Joseph again, and my wife Anne is on the line with me at this point. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, so thank you again. Again, uh, uh, good evening. First, first of all, our, our thanks to Mr. Crone and also the select board members for giving Anne and me the chance to speak with you uh, this evening. We do apologize that we're not able to be there in person. We uh, live in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, Full time, but we appreciate your willingness to let us participate by uh, by phone. Um, we, we understand from Mr. Crone that you have received a copy of our December 16th letter, and we respectfully set forth our perspective in that. And so let me just pause here to make sure you all have that. Yes, we're we're okay. most we're looking at it. Most of us uh, have uh, absorbed it in preparation for the last meeting. And what might be useful is for you to uh, summarize it. I would be delighted to do that. And so thank you for that uh, opportunity. And I would just start, I guess, with just by way of a brief background here. We recently purchased um, our home at 203 Pheasant Hill Lane. We had uh, come to love the town of uh, Shelburne after a number of visits to the area with our family on various occasions. Um, here we decided to buy a second home there as a long-term commitment to the Shelburne area. Uh, we, we still presently reside, as mentioned, full-time in Jacksonville, Florida, where I am employed, but at a point in the future post-retirement, hopefully not too much longer uh, from now, we intend to reside in Shelburne for much, much of the year. And as we had stated in our letter, uh, we, we are first-time Vermont property owners. We were unfamiliar with the town's taxing process, and we had wrongly assume that as new property owners we'd receive a notice in the mail when the taxes were due and we were wrong about that and we own the mistake and we apologize for it um, unfortunately as we had mentioned in our december 16th letter the tax notice was buried in a stack of closing documents and we were unaware that we had missed the payment until we heard from uh, mr crone and so once we became aware of it we paid the amount right away. We also immediately submitted the enrollment form for the automatic tax payment program just to make sure that we would never be late again. I will say that in our 31 years of marriage, we have consistently paid all of our bills in full and timely, and this was an inadvertent oversight on our part. Um, I would say, I, <clears throat> and I do not offer this as an excuse in any way, but we're also caring for um, frail and very elderly parents in both Jacksonville and Orlando, and so we have had a lot on our plates these the past few months. But um, we, we also explained in the letter why we believe that the penalty is excessive under the circumstances, and um, unless anyone has any questions about that part of it, I, I don't think that there's more that needs to be said in that regard. So just to sum up very briefly, this was an inadvertent omission on our part that was caused by our misunderstanding of the process. We apologize for this first time and only mistake. We've cured the issue immediately once we became aware of it. We've fixed it going forward so there's no possibility of further late payments. And as a result of all of that, we therefore respectfully ask for a waiver of the penalty or at a minimum a substantial reduction in light of the circumstances and so that's all i would add and anything else that you would want to add on your end no i'm going to ask lee to give us a uh, uh, just an overview from his perspective and one or more of uh, the members may have a question for you 
Meantime, we delighted to respond any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. So as you know from prior similar requests, there are a number of criteria in the policy that this board adopted some time back. Most of those relate to uh, unexpected financial hardship or significant medical issues. There's also a final criterion that gives you some latitude that relates to so-called extenuating, other extenuating circumstances. The amount of the total penalty, just by way of reference here, was $1,301.68. It's always a tough, tough question. Um, I wish that realtors and attorneys handling real estate affairs would be clearer with their clients about these things. I'm not saying that to blame anyone, but it's not an uncommon circumstance I have found in my many years in municipal service. And in my past life, I actually met with the Realtors Association and the Bar Association to help explain to them that, and maybe I need to do that here as well so everyone can be better informed. Thank you, Lee. Colleen, have you got a comment? Uh, I, I guess, um, first of all, welcome to Shelburne. I'm sorry this was your uh, first experience. <laughs> yes. um, and hopefully the rest of your experiences here uh, will reflect why you chose uh, Shelburne for a retirement home. Um, Thank you. Thank you for coming. I think that in the six years I've been on the select board, we've heard multiple uh, appeals for um, relief from these type of fines. And so recently we established kind of guidelines for why and when we think it's reasonable. And they really do um, center on uh, extenuating circumstances and particular hardship. I think in this particular circumstance, you have my utmost sympathy, only because I bought a commercial property about a year ago and ran into the same problem. And I paid my fine because I'm a 40-something-year-old um, <clears throat> woman, and I should know that I need to pay taxes on a quarterly basis. So, uh, and I didn't get a notice, and I got a late fine, and I paid it. And so I'm, I'm, I apologize. I... Uh, do appreciate the circumstances, um, but it doesn't qualify in my mind over why we uh, would allow an appeal. Um, I do, however, propose that I think that it's a good faith effort on your guys's part to sign up for the auto payment and um, would, if the rest of my board members uh, agreed with me, um, propose a percentage off of this fine, maybe 10%. Um, in appreciation for the uh, for the auto payment sign up. Thank you, Colleen. Mike, Lee, how much of the thirteen oh one sixty eight is an actual penalty versus interest on, or, or does it just break down as straightforward penalty? It's Peter probably would know more precisely, but the first, you know, this was their first letter received. You know, as Colleen noted, first thing from the town, so it's. It's the immediate interest and penalty, okay. and then it continues to increase if someone does not pay. In this case, they did pay it right up front, and they're hoping for a decrease or a waiver. I'm, uh, I'm our understanding was that I'm sorry. The understanding was that this was a penalty, and the interest doesn't. There's not an interest penalty until the next month. So the first month is just it's pure penalty. Oh. Yeah, Peter. So this is pure penalty? Thank you for that penalty. correction. Yeah. I'm, I'm sympathetic to Colleen's rationale, but I'd be willing to consider a more significant reduction. You have a Why? suggestion? Um, it seems to me that, um, that the issues with uh, the closing are, you know, deserve more consideration. I understand what you're saying. Everybody knows they owe taxes, and when you do a closing, that's probably one of the things that you should be paying attention to, but sort of in the spirit of welcome to Shelburne. Appreciate those comments. So, yeah, I mean, I guess And, and Matt, one question. Does, um, does anybody know what the average um, penalty is for this, for a late payment? What the average homeowner would pay as a penalty? Well, no. it's a function of the tax, that. It would depend so when, we'd, have to, yeah. we'd have to calculate an average tax, which is, relates Do back to Do you um, think it's close to what our penalty is? Well, 
Oh. Well, again, it's a function of the tax, so I'm not sure how germane okay. the point is. I mean, well, I guess my, my point is that if it's a penalty, a penalty kind of should just, you know, if we're all, if there's a lot of people making the same mistake, I mean, I think the penalty shouldn't be greater. I mean, and this isn't the interest. This is just the penalty for the mistake. I, one of our arguments in our letter was that it, it, it just seems because we are paying a lot of taxes, our, our penalty for missing it, we're being punished at a much higher rate than, than the average, than someone else making the exact same mistake, is I guess was my point. I think um, what you're saying is it feels like a disproportionate, for, for the same mistake, uh, here of oversight, it feels like there's a disproportionate impact based upon the value of the property here. And just as a, as a matter of, of fairness, it just seemed to us that, that there ought to be there ought to be something a, li a little a little closer. But in any event, we, we we've said that we we acknowledge the mistake here. There were we think extenuating circumstances by virtue of the newness, by virtue of the fact that it, that it really wasn't brought to our attention. We understand that we pay taxes. We have done that in a very law-abiding way for uh, for a long time, and we've been dealing with some very difficult issues with our, our respective fathers uh, here, too. So I guess that's just why we're asking for some lenience here. Um, my, my opinion is 10% is, 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 is not, 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 what it, not what it should be. Uh, here and if and if and if there's not a complete forgiveness of this, then there ought to be. It seems to us something more substantial. And I would ask: that, Have there been circumstances in the past similar to this? What what have what have you done? What has been the practice here? Has it been a one-time forgiveness? Particularly, I, I think, Mr. Joseph. At this point, you you you. Uh, it would be good to allow us to to continue our. Uh, 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 what expression uh, each of us is, uh, okay. yeah. what point each of us is going to make before we uh, yeah. entertain uh, what are, what are sure. understandable concerns on your part that it might not be waived in its entirety if it's going to be waived. Jamie? I appreciate uh, that. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I think, listen, mistakes happen. Welcome to Shelburne, obviously. Thank you for choosing the town. Um, that being said, I don't think this is designed as a trap for the unwary necessarily so I'm um, you know I, I don't point my finger at you as the homeowners here I think clearly the advisors drop the ball here whether it's your broker or your attorney um, I'm not sure I agree either with the argument around the value of the property sort of the disconnect between the value versus the five percent I think if we were to consider that down the road I assume your suggestion would be it should be a flat penalty amount Per property, um, which this board or a future board could take up down the road. I tend to agree with Colleen. I, I think some percentage discount on the penalty itself seems reasonable under the circumstances, so open to other suggestions on that. But uh, My sense is that uh, there's shared responsibility here, uh, even though there's no uh, identification of uh, uh, the other side of, of the, the problem. It's an understandable uh, problem that, that uh, repeats from time to time. Uh, and my sense would be perhaps to consider a 50% reduction. Fifty percent is on the table. I think that's too much. Can we split the difference? 25%. I'm comfortable with that. 25%? Is that a motion? Yeah, I guess my only concern with doing this is that, you know, we have had this situation before, and now we're sort of setting a precedent as far as I, future, I agree. We always wrestle you know, with the precedent issue. Everybody that forgets issue. now yeah. that comes before the board, we'd have to extend this 25%. Otherwise, it's an equity. Well, I don't remember a situation right? exactly like this. They're all different. Well, yeah. every of course, one, we every situation, and, like, the facts are a little bit different, right? But yeah. this, this, you know, forgetting to actually file, yeah, pay the taxes is certainly something that comes up, and it's understandable. But yeah, so I, I have a little hesitation around just negotiating a number that feels good to the group based on the amount. 
and really like uh, mine was just for the idea that they would sign that they signed up for the auto payment but part of our guidelines for any forgiveness was that they would sign up for the auto payment so right. you yeah, know that's... by that argument the 10 percent wouldn't even apply but i guess it was <clears throat> right but you okay i think that. the homeowners introduced some additional facts here outside the letter regarding your your parents and you know care for them that wasn't really reflected here so you know to that extent that sounds to me like more extenuating than forgetting to file it so yeah. i'm acknowledging that there's something there to consider that, as far as relief goes but i'm not sure just negotiating a number because it feels good to the board is the best practice for us do you have a better alternative i, I think 10 percent felt reasonable to me and it would be because of the additional information not because they forgot to file okay then a motion, Colleen. Okay, move to reduce the penalty by 10%, which would be $130.01. Is there a second? Second. Jamie seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay? I'll say nay. Nay. Okay. Motion is approved three to one. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph. Uh, do, do we have an opportunity for, I, 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 I don't know that we do, but it, it, it honestly doesn't appreciate the conversation and the opportunity to make our position, but it, it, it honestly does not feel fair uh, to us. It honestly does not feel like much of a welcome to Shelburne here, and it's, and it's a disappointing outcome, uh, to say the least, here after we feel like we have done everything that we uh, could have here. I thought we were headed in the right direction here. With the circumstances, I could go on to provide a lot of additional detail about our parents and my wife's father's dementia and the fact that my father's been in the emergency room on multiple occasions over the last several months uh, here. But so I, I just I, I, I guess I'm having a hard time, frankly, understanding the outcome uh, here. Well, we do we do appreciate your concern, really and we'd, we'd invite you to to uh, to communicate to the town manager. Uh, uh, if you have further concerns that you'd like us to uh, uh, consider. And meantime, we do welcome you, and uh, we appreciate your being available to us to, uh, uh, to uh, help us with the decision. I mean, I, I guess I would say I'm, I'm open to reconsidering it if you'd like to supplement the letter and provide additional facts. I think you heard from me sort of what I found most compelling about the fact situation so I'll, I'll leave it at that and remain open-minded as far as supplements to this request because that, that's an additional category yes i'm sorry that's an additional <clears throat> category of uh of of consideration what you've introduced that that was not uh expressed in the letter that is a circumstance uh a, a, a circumstance at home so uh, we'd encourage you to communicate with Lee and uh, take the matter further, if you wish, and uh, provide us with, uh, as Jamie uh, suggested, uh, additional information on the on the circumstance of your uh, parents. Okay. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. The next item is to re receive proposed zoning amendments and warn for public hearing. Now, there are two motions involved. One is to uh, move to receive, and the second is to <coughs> warn the public hearing. Sure, what you could do is one motion. Dean Pierce is here to explain this. The, some additional minor proposals related to the form-based code amendments we've already prepared to warn for February 11, and the suggestion here, Dean will explain, but the plan would be to warn these for the 11th as well and do them all at once. <clears throat> Given this matter was on the agenda for five minutes, I did not load slides on the computer. However, I do have slides from the Planning Commission presentation if those are desired. And the other important point uh, to note is that these are proposed amendments to the subdivision regulations uh, on the agenda. It identifies them as zoning amendments. There are amendments to the bylaws, but uh, specifically to the subdivision bylaws. Uh, this is a proposal, the purpose of which is to do two things, uh, and as Lee said, 
part of it is to make some changes that are driven by the proposed form-based zoning amendment. If the form-based zoning amendment, which you will be hearing in February, is approved, that section will have a new number. And if it has a new number, the subdivision regs should update their numbers. And we neglected to include that aspect in the original package. And so a key part of this is updated numbers, or references, I should say, that are contained in some definitions. The second part of this is more substantive, and it relates to def uh, changing the definition of subdivision. And you would think, OK, you have subdivision regulations, so they apply to subdivisions. So what's a subdivision? Well, in fact, uh, in subdivision regulations, subdivisions can be more than they would initially appear. And in Shelburne's case, the definition of subdivision includes other types of development, such as shopping centers, multifamily housing projects, elderly housing projects, industrial parks. It's something that if we had more time, I could get into the history of. But suffice it to say that under Shelburne's current definition of subdivision, certain things have to go through a review process because they're included in that. And what that means is for, for some projects, they have to go through three discrete steps of review as part of subdivision. And the thinking behind this proposed amendment is that if certain projects go through form-based zoning, they don't need to have redundant reviews under the subdivision bylaw. So that's the general gist of it, that the Planning Commission, in hearing some of the comments about what, and, and reflecting on some of the reasons for form-based zoning, which were to encourage development in the Route 7 corridor, make the review process happen more quickly, that part of the bylaw changes that that reflects could also include what you're seeing tonight, which is to pare down the definition of subdivision, but to do it in a way that leaves things ad hoc, or leaves things status quo, I should say, when someone doesn't choose form-based zoning, but it gives them a lighter review process. It removes this additional review when they go through form-based zoning. So if you do form-based zoning, we say you're not a subdivision and you don't have to go through that review. But if you're not using form-based zoning, it's just as it's always been. I'd be happy to get into any of the details you have or answer questions. But it's, um, it's on the website. I have some additional paper copies for anybody in the audience that might want them. This is in increasing the incentive, yep. essentially, mm -hmm. to use form-based zoning. Yes, I believe that it would. And um, yes, I believe that it would. It would make it more attractive to people. I'm not sure that, um, yes, I believe it would have that effect. And, and I'll use as an example the project that is taking place on the Yankee Doodle pro uh, property. That hearing was held on form-based zoning, and yet there were multiple additional hearings that were done solely as a result of the fact that, it, that multifamily is included or elderly housing is included in the definition of subdivision. And it really meant, you know, some people would call it extraneous review. Yeah. I mean, one of the principles is expediting regulatory review under the form-based zoning. So consistent with That's what this is doing? That. Just out of curiosity, so and this isn't meant to be critical, but we've seen several amendments to various features of, of the zoning laws. Is that standard to sort of find an issue that you need to do some work on, make some proposed changes, bring it to the board. It, from my perspective, it's sort of trying to piece together a puzzle sometimes, like yes. where is this going in terms of change? I know we've talked about holistic regulatory reform, yeah. and I'm just wondering how do we sync up yeah. kind well, of? In this specific example, uh, I think that if, if the Planning Commission hadn't seen daylight, hadn't seen the light at the end of the tunnel with the foreign based zoning package, uh, and hadn't wanted to see it progress, we might have realized before that the Planning Commission's part was done that this would have all been included and we wouldn't be really having this conversation. It would be all part. However, your comment's valid. The Planning Commission in recent years has become the recipient of numerous requests for zoning changes. And um, I would say that 
The response of the Planning Commission to those changes um, has varied over time. Uh, when I first arrived here, the practice was much more, um, we will hear your comment, we will hear your suggestion, and we'll consider making a proposal to the select board maybe once or twice a year. Um, several years ago, under a different chair, the, the practice of the Planning Commission became much more, um, we respond to requests, if a request sounds like it's valid, uh, then we'll move it along. And that, that carries um, some reward for the person who's making the request, but it also has an administrative burden, yeah. both for staff and for board members. And I frankly personally don't feel that it's ideal Okay, thanks. But it is what it is. Yeah. And as far as timing for when the broader update will come before this board? We, you've received the Florida Bay Zoning Package and worn it for February 11th, and okay. the calendar is just so. So February 11th February is already 11th is in the date. Right. Okay, good. And we have time to publish a warning, and then we can consolidate the review. Yeah. So this is just a supplement to that, really. In a sense, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we're just fixing just, the numbering and adding that change yep. to the subdivision. We're lucky ranks. that there are okay. five Wednesdays and Thursdays. This <laughs> yeah, <is> good. <laughs> we're just accepting these amendments yep. and adding it to the warning. Move to it. Do you have you okay I with the motion? It. Or? Yeah. Go ahead. I yeah. Move to accept. You want to do it? I don't care. Okay. I have it if you want. Move to accept the proposed amendments to the Shelburne subdivision regulations as proposed, and warrant a public hearing for February 11th, 2020. Second. By Jamie. Seconded by Colleen. Any further discussion? Any questions? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The next item is a public hearing on proposed budget for fiscal year 2020 2020 2021 which is a continuation from uh, the last meeting january 14th thank you so many of you were here over the last series of meetings and have observed the conversation the select board made a number of changes at last week's meeting, there are copies on the table. The board has them. The net result of those various changes was to bring in a budget that would create a proposed tax rate increase of 5.73%, which is a pretty significant decrease from where we started. And the board has, I think, scrubbed this budget quite well. There may be other questions, concerns, or comments, but. Hopefully, we can bring this to a landing tonight. We can go through more detail if you wish. Peter has prepared a summary sheet of where all those changes were. Um, and as you wish from here. You want to ask Peter if he's got any comment or role? <clears throat> Are there any questions in the public? Mike? I, I mean, I'm very proud of our work. I think we've accomplished a pretty Herculean feat, well, what seemed Herculean at the beginning. My only, uh, my concern is, is sort of around opportunity costs. I wonder at what point we've shortchanged ourselves for some long-term improvements, but, you know, how can you tell exactly? So it's, you know, I'm wondering, have, I'd like to get a good grip on if we haven't cut so much in some areas that we're going to be unable to discharge some of our basic duties. But I think we've done a good job, um, given a tough financial picture to begin with. So um, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm particularly concerned still about economic development position. Is it enough to do what we want to be able to do? Have we lost some opportunity costs there or created some? And open space. I mean, when I was listening to Gail talk about what we've been able to do with open space over the past few years and looking at the markets and the opportunities in Shelburne, I wonder if we're going to lose some opportunities there because we're shortchanging that. But I realize that, you know, we have to make these changes and we have to make these cuts. So still I'm a little apprehensive. It's a hard thing to look at all the need we have and, and to think, you know, that we started with 4.1 and essentially we're adding 1.6. You know, are we really doing the town any favors by funding it at a 1.6 increase over, you know, um, debt? So, again, I'm, I'm comfortable with this, but I get a little nervous thinking about it. So, anyway. Colleen? Well, I guess.
guess I'm. <sighs> Can I just ask you to clarify? What uh, duties do you feel like we are not going to be able to do uh, to do what we need to do? Well, we've Which talked about we've talked about just uh, you know capital improvements, maintenance, fix it first, which I thought was a really reasonable idea. But did we leave enough in the budget, all things considered, to actually do that? Or the paving budget? You know, are we are we shortchanging the highway department in a way that's going to create more problems down the road that are going to be more expensive? Uh, economic development position. I mean, I'm you know, I'm just sort of speculating i'm i'm hoping that we've been prudent and sort of threaded the needle here um and you know we had a tough situation to begin with and i think we're doing a good job of of funding that at a rate you know 5.7 seems like a, a large increase um so but still you know yeah i you know i just i hope we haven't missed opportunities to invest in crucial features of the town um, and I just, you know, just putting that out on the table. So you brought up a couple of points that I wanted to also highlight, and I know this isn't going to be um, a popular opinion, but we did get a, quite a few letters from uh, citizens, and there was one in particular that he did bring up the fact that we have this new line item of 25000 for economic development, and to many people in, uh, in the town, it seems like it came out of nowhere. You know, we know that this has been a discussion on the board for years, and it wasn't until recently that, we, that it really started gaining momentum. Um, I can see his point that it seems like we're putting something in there and we don't really know how we're going to use it and we're doing it in a year that's we've sent out the message that this is a tough year and then we're putting this money aside and we don't know how we're going to use it but we're going to use it and I have supported um, the initiative uh, for economic development um, but I've questioned that particular line item myself. I don't want to take away from the momentum, and I think it does say something about where we want to head, but I do, I am concerned about it. I don't at this point propose taking it out, but I think it should at least be publicly stated that it is a concern. Um, as far as uh, being able to do what we need to do, um, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job, especially with Paul Goodrich here, about exactly what we were going to not be able to pave and what we were going to be able to pave. And I don't think there's going to be roads in Shelburne that are going to be in horrible condition, undrivable, or unsafe. And so I think that we are doing what's prudent. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think that was about it. Jamie, comment? Yeah, no, I mean, it goes without saying this was a hard budget year. Right. Um, I feel like we've cut to the bone here as far as what we're proposing and potentially aligning on. Um, I also feel like we've underfunded some priorities and opportunities here, but I also sort of appreciate that, you know, we've done a nice job just from a fiscal stewardship perspective and recognizing sort of what we heard from the community around affordability, right? We have a, a creeping tax rate both at the municipal level and at the school level. Um, the long-term debt's the long-term debt. We're sort of at the peak year, so we're going to get a little bit more room to do some things down the road. Um, that being said, I, I feel good about what we're proposing here. I think we'll be able to do what we need to do. Thankfully, we have a, a crack management team in place here that manages the budget very tightly. Yeah. And we've had the good fortune of having a, a surplus, right, in the last few years. So hopefully we'll be able to to leverage some of those funds that have been earmarked for certain opportunities that are not yet scoped out. For example, economic development that we know needs some work, but we want to make sure that the investment's there for us to to leverage down the road. Um, that's you. it for me. Well, Lee, this, this calculation does include the uh, um, the fiscal, this fiscal, the 2020, 2021 cost of the radio bond, correct? Yes. And it includes open space? Yes. Yes, it does. And includes the select board compensation? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. So it seems to me that the shorthand is we began with a 4% plus budget, and we've increased it less than the cost of living. That seems to me to be uh, 
a job fairly well done. No one cannot regret that the tax rate is going to increase 6%. That's not to say that the, we're happy about that. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, scrutinizing items by item, in terms of thinking through what are the, are the opportunity costs as, as Mike introduces them, uh, in considering items that we don't have all the detail for now and the economic development one is by no means the only one. Uh, I do feel that this has been, uh, in, in my uh, tenure here on the board, uh, the most uh, satisfying uh, process in the end uh, as, as we finish tonight in thinking that uh, we've done the job that you expect us to do. And I think failing to do that is worse than having a tax increase. I think an increase of any kind is probably more acceptable on the part of the community if they feel genuinely that we really tried to limit it. And in this case, uh, I think I speak for all of us, uh, Lee and Peter especially, to say that uh, we didn't get here easily and we didn't get here in a few nights, but we are here and I think uh, rightly so, and, and uh, uh, I urge its, its positive consideration when the time comes. Is there any further discussion? Gail? I would just say that um, I really appreciate your concern, Mike, for um, natural resources, and the struggle that you've had in trying to pull the <laughs> pull this budget together. Um, just as a comment and a, a thought for the future, and that is that every year unexpected expenses do come up. And every year, I think for the, at least the last 10, we've often heard that um, requests can't be met because there are bonding issues and unexpected expenses. And it's just something to keep in mind as you continue to your deliberations in, in future years or even this year that um, we don't know what the future holds. And so some of those opportunity costs may be worth looking at. Thank you, Gail. Any other comments? Is there a motion to Approve. Motion. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. We must close the public hearing yeah. first. Sure. Mike moves to do so. Second. Jamie seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The, cl the public hearing is closed. Is there a motion to approve? Move to adopt the proposed budget for fiscal year 2020-2021 and warn for um, town meeting on, was it March 2nd? Colleen moves to adopt. March 2nd. March 2nd. Jamie seconds. Second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you for the comments and thank you for all of the participation throughout this period on the part of uh, many of you, uh, including some not here tonight. It was, uh, uh, it was very important to us to have been able to discuss this and share the decision making with the, with the community the way we were able to. The next item is to uh, warn the town meeting. We did that. We do well if that last we motion just did that. included it. Included both. We did that. <clears throat> okay, then we're all set. So the whole warning? Yep. Yeah. We should. And warn for the town meeting on March 2nd. I think we just approved the we budget. We just did it. No, I said. Uh, um, I thought we, approved I thought we the just did the budget yep. too. Proposed but budget and warn for town meeting on March 2nd. Did you do them? Well, just for, just for I the sake of it, yeah. we have an additional did, mo right? a yeah. motion to warn the town meeting. <laughs> Move for a town meeting on uh, March 2nd. 2021, 2020, mm. 2020. Move to, <laughs> just to be clear, right? You're moving to approve the so warning. So we'll approving as the warning yeah. as Jamie proposed. moves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, just sorry, not to confuse this anymore. Yeah. We don't need to read any of the articles to warn. We can. We can. No. Are there no. I'm I'm not there. No, it's fair. I wasn't sure what was yeah. the appropriate way no, to warn. Fair enough. Yeah. We'll do that. We can certainly do it if you wish. Why not? 
sure. people are here, we're probably running ahead of time. So you have fresh copies with the, late, with the precise updated figures. There are copies on the table. This is the warning for town meeting. The legal voters of the town of Shelburne are hereby notified and warned to meet at the Shelburne Community School on Monday, March 2nd, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. to hear about and act upon any of the following items not involving voting by Australian ballot and to hold a public hearing on items to be voted by Australian ballot. The meeting will then be adjourned and reconvened in the Shelburne town offices on Tuesday, March 3, 2020 to vote for town officers and to transact any business involving voting by Australian ballot from the hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And most of these are the same as you've heard in past years. Article 1, to hear and act on the report of the town officers and the auditor's report for fiscal year 2019, July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2019. Article 2, will the voters determine the compensation to be, should say, to be paid to the select board for fiscal year 2021? July 1, 2020 through June 30, 2021. And as a friendly reminder, the reason that's on there is the select board can't set its own salary, so every year at town meeting, the voters set their compensation, which might be up to a nickel an hour for all the time you spend in doing these things. Article three, to transact any other business proper to come before town meeting. Ballot questions to be voted by Australian ballot. Article 4, to elect all town officers as required by law. Article 5, shall the town adopt the select board's proposed budget of $9,504,936, of which $7,227,185 is to be raised by taxes. Article 6, shall the town raise by taxes $30,000 for the purpose of obtaining options and or acquiring land or rights in land to preserve natural resources and open space, any unspent portion of that amount to be put into the open space fund. Article 7, shall the voters authorize the purchase of new radio communications equipment for the police department in an amount not to exceed $210,000 to be financed over a period not to exceed five years. Dated at Shelburne, Vermont, this 21st of January, 2020, by the Shelburne Select Board. Can you just point me to the 9504 where that ties back to the budget? So, am I missing? The reason the number in the warning is different than the number in the budget is that at your request, this budget the open adopted, space fund is. is fully baked in. Select boards, yeah. presumed salaries, the open space fund. But gotcha. what we're voting is a bare bones budget plus potentially open space and plus presumably the voters will pre grant you a stipend for the coming year. So the numbers are different because this shows everything baked in, presuming approval as of yeah. in past years. This is the actual basic budget, and then plus the additional items. Gotcha. Thank you. Any qu Gail? Oh, last meeting that it might be useful to include as a header for this budget that um, the num how the numbers are included. Um, for those ballot items? Well, we, the, the intention is to include it at each of those two ballot items, the separate ones, uh, a little annotation, as we discussed at the last meeting. So rather than a general heading, which might get lost in the shuffle, we'll, we'll put, as, as Lee and Peter are in the habit of doing, uh, a, a, an annotation below both of those two articles. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? The, the 573 is the fully loaded for open space, assuming it's approved. I think plus. so. I, I just think it, it's important for voters to understand that um, you have already included those amounts and don't feel as though it's an addition to the amount that's included in the budget. Yeah. yeah we'll, Which we'll, is the practice we've 
you know, had for a number of years. Okay, at thanks. Least as far as I know, right? Well, we'll I'm make not sure several, that's... We'll make uh, yeah. that point on several occasions. I, yeah. I know, mean, last year no when we what. approved it, we definitely included the 35 on open space when we looked at the, the percentage. So I can't and speak And this year it's years, 30, but, not 35. Correct. Right. Uh, because the, the, the number now yeah. is going to have some currency uh, for the next six weeks or so. Yeah. And yeah. what we're doing is making sure that that number includes the potential. We're not prejudging votes, but the potential yeah. of the yes. radio bond passing, as well as a decision on, co on compensation for the board, and as well uh, open space. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, should any of that not happen, then the rate would be less, yes. but we're... We feel pretty strongly that we should show the maximum possible, and that's the number now that will be, you know, uh, will be kind of coin of the realm. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. So is this the way that it was phrased in previous years, Article 2? So, um, and, and I'd like just take out the two, uh, the compensation paid to the select board, but I thought we put the amounts in. We didn't do that in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure in prior years. Last year, this board was asking the voters not, not to. to give you anything, so we added a note in there, and clearly the voters put it back in. Yep. We could go either way. I mean, I can, if we want to make a change to this, I can do that later, and we can still sign this. Right. So this would require a, a, an affirmative motion for a specific number from someone on the floor? Correct. Right. Is that typically how we do it or is there a number that I thought there was a number in there was, well last year was in well, last right. year it was zeroed out Zero. so the motion I just want to make sure I mean I know the there are people who will know the number but someone needs to have a baseline number that right. that it was 1200 a year yes yeah is right? the chair yeah. I think Colleen makes makes a point Lee that yeah. it, it's a little cleaner to have the number that's in the budget Right. So there's no confusion right. that mm -hmm. we have an article that has a, that has no sure. number, but the budget has it. Right. Yeah. And just have the number that that's been budgeted and seek approval on that basis. Yes. Yeah. Then the explanation can be given that that the prior this results from a prior year. So we could add a note similar to what we had yeah. last year. Yeah. Exactly. That might make a factual statement without appearing to sway yeah, the outcome. Exactly. Will the voters approve compensation <laughs> in the amount of X and Y to be paid to? As presented. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think that sounds right. People can say, no, I think it should be. I think me. that would. Right. <laughs> or I think that would be cleaner. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But I, I'm comfortable approving this yep. with that I am amendment. Too. Yeah, for sure. Agreed. Yeah, me too. I don't think we need to, need to agreed. delay yeah. it to another yeah. week. So we'll clean this up and Bring yep. it back for your signatures. Great. Yes. Okay. Okay. Makes sense, Peter. So moved with the Any stated and amendment. Further discussions? Second. Hearing none. Colleen has moved uh, approval. Second. Jamie seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Well Next. Next item is a public hearing, on, which is the first reading per our charter on a proposed stormwater ordinance and credit manual. This is to revise the existing uh, uh, ordinance and is something we routinely refer to as the municipal utility. Lee? Thank you. Do we need an official proposal to open the hearing? We need I don't think motion. it's a public hearing. This no. is just a, an introduction, right? We, it was warned as a public it hearing okay. before realizing that the charter adds a bit of complexity to it. So it would be helpful oh, right. to get a motion to open it. Ultimately, we'll close it and explain the process from here. Okay. So I move okay. to open. Mike moves. Second. Colleen seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. So given that, in a sense, we are starting over on this process at the select board level, I thought it would be helpful to revisit a revised version of the prior presentation that had been given to you a year or two ago and just sort of bring us all back on a common playing field of why we're dealing with stormwater at all. So stormwater, I'm sure we know, is 
runoff, rain, snow, other materials coming from impervious surfaces, asphalt, gravel roads are considered roughly the same, rooftops, parking lots. And based on state and federal mandates, municipalities are now forced to deal with this in a much more comprehen comprehensive way than we used to do. Stormwater that's not treated just runs off may well end up in the lake. We're all well aware of concerns that have been raised over water quality in recent years. There's all sorts of infrastructure created to deal with stormwater. In some cases, it's simply pipes and culverts letting water flow. It may involve catch basins. It may involve oil water separators, um, dirt and dust traps that trap out sediments before they flow on. It may involve subsurface practices such as shown here, where ultimately this was covered by a parking lot. Stormwater drains into these perforated pipes, infiltrates into the ground, rather than just flowing directly off. Sometimes it's detention ponds, sometimes it's a, a trench, sometimes it's a rain garden. So there are many different ways of dealing with it. Unfortunately, many of them very expensive. This is a rain garden installed in 2016. Of course, they don't work quite as well at this time of year, but they're still helpful. So we have local rules, and now the umbrella of state and federal mandates thrust upon us that we all have to do something about stormwater. We operate under a variety of permits today. We share some permits that are on our own, some with private entities. These may involve simply mowing, removing trees, removing sediment from catch basins. It involves an awful lot of paperwork and permitting, which Chris Robinson, our water quality superintendent, knows all too well. And the, many of these entities need to be inspected every year and updated to meet current regs. I'm not going to go into all of this, but we also operate under what's called an MS4 permit, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And it involves six separate measures that are involved, everything from public education and outreach to actually handling and managing stormwater. We also know that we have some impaired waterways, and those create problems for stormwater management as well. We have to work on phosphorus control plans, flow restoration plans, and all of these interact in complicated ways. In particular, the Monroe Brook watershed is shown in the white outline here. And some of it's developed, some of it's ag land, some of it's forested and open land. Depending on how agriculture is handled, it may be a helpful element in stormwater management, or it could be a very unhelpful element. Agriculture is estimated to be, on balance, statewide, one of the major contributors to phosphorus pollution in the lake. But if one follows helpful agricultural practices, it can be reduced dramatically. In this area alone, there are 32 stormwater treatment projects either done or that need to be done. Ten of these have been built. There are still 22 to go. And you can see the cost estimate there. It's in the millions of, of dollars. Doesn't mean we're paying for all of that. But nonetheless, none of this is easy or simple or inexpensive. So public projects, private projects, some of these private-public partnerships. So how are we going to pay for all this? There are two primary ways that municipalities can raise the funds to deal with stormwater. You can do it on the property tax, or as other municipalities have done and we're proposing to do, we can create a utility and set up a user fee system. I'll tell you, doing it on the property tax base is a whole lot easier to collect. We already tax everybody's property, and you add something else to it. Little administrative cost. It's fairly invisible once it's baked in. But it's also subject to shifting pressures and priorities, such as we went through significantly in the last several months. The advantage of a utility and a user fee is that it's more equitable. It's based on the amount of runoff each property is generating. And it includes tax-exempt parcels, because every property is generating stormwater, whether you're a property taxpayer or you're a, an exempt property owner. It also ensures that the funds raised are dedicated to stormwater management. They can't be taken away and used for some other purpose or decreased based on budgetary pressures. 
It's a more flexible approach because we can also build in a credit system so that property owners who are already managing stormwater can, be, can receive an offset on the fees they would otherwise have to pay. Because, of course, the goal at the end of the day is managing stormwater. So again, we can have credits, build in incentives. It does add administrative costs because now we've got to do some analysis of properties, especially the non-single family residential properties to determine how much impervious surface they have, what are they generating, do they deserve credits. So there's a lot of work on the back end. And just by way of information, this is a map showing the tax-exempt properties currently in Shelburne. So it's a fair bit of property. We're blessed to have it, but it generates stormwater as well. Just a rough breakdown from 2017, area of town by existing land uses, and then impervious area by existing land uses. Fairly similar, but in some ways significantly different. So utility is funded by user fees, very similar to sewer or water or electricity. In a rough sense, you pay for what you use or generate. The more you generate, the higher your fee will be. The more you manage the stormwater, the more credits you might be able to earn to offset those fees. So impervious surface data, Tom DiPietro can explain in more detail if needed. Tom's been an amazingly helpful expert consultant with us all along through this process. He works for the city of South Burlington. Couldn't do it without you, Tom. Thank you. So satellite imagery are analyzed to determine what is and what is not impervious to give us reasonably accurate estimates on uh, the amount of impervious surface on properties. I won't get into a lot of detail here, but we had to create a basis for how we do these calculations. We're trying to follow the lead of other municipalities that have already done this and tested it both legally and practically. So we end up with a measurement called an equivalent residential unit. These data are somewhat dated. We'll be updating these in the very near future. Each unit is currently roughly about 4,200 square feet. And you do the math and figure out how many equivalent residential units that you have based on impervious area, which calculates to what your fee might be. So we have round numbers, roughly 9,000 of these billable equivalent residential units, and that gets divided up on a proportional basis for each property. Town roads, town properties also counted in this, so we're not exempt ourselves. Currently, in the budget we just adopted to present to the voters, there's a, still a $206,000 funding element on the tax base. We level funded that from this year. It is anticipated that we will bring in an additional $170,000 next year on the user fees to give us round numbers of $400,000 budget. It's estimated currently that a single family residential property in the lowest tier it would be somewhat higher than $43 a year, but that's a round figure. If it's 50, 60, 70, we're talking less than $100 per year for most single family homes in town which is a fair bit less than some of the other adjoining municipalities are charging at this time. The reason we're doing this instead of pretending we can measure exact square footage in every single property is the technology and the administrative costs of actually trying to analyze that for several thousand properties in town would just be unduly burdensome. And we're trying to find fair and reasonable ways to balance the need and the um, practicality of adopting a system that's workable. So just by way of example on a commercial property, if the property were round numbers half an acre in size and had 18,000 square feet of impervious, it would calculate out to something like a $225 a year fee. That larger properties will clearly have much higher fees, but again there are credit systems baked into this as well. The credits apply only to non-residential properties because there are fewer of those, they have more impervious, and they're more readily subject to reasonably accurate estimates of impervious land area. 
changes since the last time we went through this process. There was a lot of discussion about trying to create some sense of equity for single-family residential properties. So we're now proposing a two-tier system, properties with less than one acre of impervious, which is most of them, and properties with one acre or more of impervious surface would be subject to a higher fee. Again, non-single-family residential based on an actual analysis of the properties derived from satellite imagery. Another key change from the last proposal was phasing the fees in over a three-year time frame. So 33% first year, 66% second year, and 100% in the third year. The reasons to do that are several. One, let everyone get used to this and not get hit with sticker shock. Also recognizing it for those landowners who may be doing some work on their own to manage stormwater or to prove that they deserve credits we're not hitting them with the full fee up front and also realizing they will be incurring costs to go through the credit system. So we're trying to ramp this up in a fair way, get everyone used to it, and again acknowledge that some landowners will be also incurring their own private costs. We increased the education credit from 10% to 20%. We increased the agriculture credit from 25% to 45%. Those were in large part intended to help address concerns raised by several large nonprofit landowners in town that are, that are tax exempt, but provide great benefit to the town and at the same time um, have programs that would likely qualify for these credits to try to lessen the financial burden. There are four different stormwater treatment practices that collectively could earn a landowner up to a 55% credit. So, for example, a property like the Automaster that has invested significant dollars in stormwater management on its own property could earn credits off of the fee they'd otherwise incurred because they've already done what we're really asking everyone to do, which is manage stormwater. The total maximum credit has also been increased to 75%. So if somebody can do everything possible, they could earn a credit of three quarters of their fee, whether that's a theoretical or an actual maximum will remain to be seen, but we tried to raise these credits as much as possible and still meet what I call the straight face test that everybody needs to pay in somehow. Again, I ran through the budget implications for next year, and that's a very quick overall introduction. Why stormwater? Why do we need to deal with this? Um, I'd like to thank everyone who worked with us who's either an official or an unofficial member of the advisory committee over this past year. We were tasked with reworking this system and trying to find a way to resolve concerns and bring you back a system that we thought could work for everyone. And it was a hard, hard one exercise, but at the end of the day, the committee met its own challenge, which was come in as a unified front. Everyone could support this latest approach to the process. That's as far as I intend to go at the moment. There may well be questions, discussion. Other members of the committee are here, and I thank them all for their hard work over this past year. We certainly do that. It's good to see some of you, and we appreciate greatly the effort, especially Tom. Um, does anyone have a question or comment? Gail. Just curious, I know that you said that um, homeowners would be um, in two different categories, I think you yep. described. And I wondered if um, intact f forest lands or whatever on somebody's property would influence where those properties fall. I think it's one acre of impervious is the trigger on the right. two. Yeah. So okay. residential properties are charged a flat fee, either a lower fee if you have less than one acre of impervious or a higher flat fee if it's more than one acre. But so if, if most of the property is forest land and it's residential, then it's just capped at that flat Lowest fee. Lowest residential. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Don. <clears throat> 
Uh, my name is Don Porter, and I live at uh, 340 South 40 Road. Uh, I have a couple of questions, um, one that probably could best be addressed by Chris, uh, and that is that um, the uh, uh, FRP, the management plan, uh, is a pretty extensive plan and comprehensive, uh, the intent of which is to reduce stormwater uh, infiltration and inflow, the I and I issues that are involved in, you know, wastewater systems. Um, could you maybe give a quick uh, estimate of what the investment in the stormwater uh, mitigation program would do to improve our I and I inflow rate in the wastewater it system? Probably won't, um, because a lot of the stormwater treatment practices are typically yeah. Chris, pipe Chris, it would be helpful if you oh. take the mic and. Look. Let the audience know who you are. Chris Wa Robinson, the water quality superintendent. So it, you probably won't see any change at all in the wastewater side of things. Uh, most of your stormwater treatment practices typically happen at the end of a pipe. So, uh, you know, the, the issues we have are actually in manholes and stuff, groundwater, um, not, just, not just inflow, but groundwater and so forth. So it's a completely separate issue of having to button up the, store, the uh, wastewater system. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> second question, just, just to be uh, clear, this first year is the 33% year, and that's roughly 400,000 of investment in, in the stormwater program. So next year will be 800,000, and the year after that will be a million too. Is that mm, correct? Mm, no. The the premise was that the 206,000 is on the tax base, estimated 170 next year from the user fees. So second year, as we ramp up the user fees, the impact on the tax base should decrease, at least roughly proportionally, because the estimate is we need that amount of money to raise. So as we increase the user fees, we should be decreasing the tax base. Ultimately, okay. the goal is that the stormwater program is paid for by user fees from every property in town. Okay, so and not just on the property owners who have to pay property taxes. Okay, so make sure kind so of So it may be 400,000 flat rate for the next several years because as one increases, the other should be decreasing at least roughly proportionally. Okay, so the, the increase 33% next year would result in a larger fee for uh, the municipal utility fee, but a correspondingly smaller mm -hmm. contribution from, from property tax. Yeah, so exactly. it's roughly $400,000 a year yeah, you're, you're for, for 20 years out to 2032. Non-contributing properties over three years is right. the concept, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, John. Any other comments? Questions? Good evening. My name Good is evening. Richard Downer. I live in an impaired watershed, namely uh, Monroe Brook on Longmeadow Drive. And uh, I've been concerned for quite some time about how uh, this program is intended to work, and I'll give you an example here. Got some photographs to share. I'd like to pass them around for you here. It doesn't seem to me that this problem is addressed by the ordinance in any way, and I cite the example that uh, those animals are on a private residence property. 80% uh, or so of some which is uh, agricultural land. So they would be able to get a flat rate for allowing their cows to defecate in the stream uh, under the new program. So I ask you, I'm not here to speak against, the, I like the idea of the program, but I think it has some loopholes, major loopholes, and this is one of them. An example is that you've been taken advantage of in the Monroe Brook because the monitoring point 
is downstream of these animals. It's actually at the point where the water passes through the culvert under Shelburne Road, which means that we living in Longmeadow and uh, up in Quinneaska and in Hullcrest are paying for those animals. We're in an uh, impaired watershed because of those animals, not because our dogs defecate in the backyard. And so I say to you, you need to solve this problem of how to get those animals out of the water. Thank you. I'll admit to some confusion. I'm, I'm not sure how that, I'm not sure how that relates to impervious surface. Well, I mean, you're, you seem to be addressing a problem of pollution, Which point pollution from, from cattle but I'm not sure how that relates to the, pro to the proposal here for a municipal utility. Well, I see the problem as it isn't just the volume of runoff, it's the quality of the right. runoff. Yeah. And uh, each of us uh, homeowners have very little quantity and in most cases very little quality issues. You know, the dog defecates in the backyard kind of thing we maybe spread some fertilizer. But in this case here, you have a situation of large quantities of runoff with extremely high uh, quality content from the cows. And we, you are spending money to, uh, in the case of Longmeadow and uh, Hullcrest, spending money to collect the sediment and things like that, when you need not have done that, you could have just removed the cows. Now I know their agriculture here in this state gets a special exemption, but at some time you're gonna have to face it because you're wasting your, our money by ignoring those animals. And this is, I drive by there every day on my way to work, so I see them, but I know what's happening in other places here in Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Downer. Do you well, want to? <laughs> it's, it's a good point you raise. It's never going to be a perfect system, but nor can we ignore these. But we've got to start somewhere. And I'm thank you for raising it. You want to respond? I mean, we can talk about it if you want to go further into this discussion. I'm Marty Hiller from the Little Pig Association, and I'm yeah, we oh, can't hear you. Pardon me. <laughs> Not sure if Tom wanted to take this one. Um, my name is Marty Illick, and I'm on the storm. I was on the Stormwater Advisory Committee, um, and I could respond a little bit to the gentleman's concern, um, mostly with my Lewis Creek Association hat on, which would be the Monroe Brook watershed was deemed impaired for stormwater. So that's altogether different than ag and E. coli issues. Mm, um, and maybe a little erosion from the storm, uh, stream banks that have to do with the cows trampling the stream bank. Um, but the wraps are embedded into the stormwater utility, which are the new rules for ag. So the cows will not be able to um, be in the stream as that picture depicts. So that should be taken care of through the agency of ag's wraps. Um, and with regard to uh, monitoring the Monroe Brook, um, as is done today, just to keep up with the stormwater impairment concern, um, that does need to keep happening. It does not have to do with E. coli. It has to do with erosion and sediment and phosphorus uh, and, um, and flow, primarily flow, because it's stormwater impaired, if that makes sense to you. It does. One of the other... One of the other problems with that piece of land is that there's a small dam just before the water goes into the culvert under Shelburne, and that dam has been breached. The water doesn't go behind the dam anymore. It goes in front of the dam. The result is if you look at those pictures and you study that land, you see the, the brook there, Monroe Brook, is incising dramatically the banks are now between three and four feet deep. And that's happened over the last five or six years. And again, it's because uh, 
the stream cannot access its floodplain. And it's only going to get worse with the banks carve, caving in and the stream is going to get wider and there'll be a great deal more sedimentation coming off that piece of land simply because the landowner has allowed the stream to incise. Thank you. I'll, I'll say something. My, my name is Owen Clay. I'm, I'm the operations manager at Shelburne Farms and I've been part of, of the, the committee. And, uh, you know, I, I so I, I, I feel for the agricultural questions and I just wanted to bring it back to the, the, the subject at, at hand, uh, particularly the agricultural credits, which may or may not have been on your mind in terms of this. And, uh, <coughs> as mentioned, the, the, the RAPs are re required agricultural practices that, that the state monitors and enforces. In order to get any agricultural credit, you have to meet those, and, and that's serious business, and, and just, just wanted to say that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, just from Shelburne Farms' perspective, and being as part of part of the committee working working with the group and with Lee on trying to get to consensus, uh, you know, we at the farm have come to understand that, including every property in town, uh, is is a prerequisite to moving forward with the stormwater ordinance. And, and <clears throat> given that, given that understanding, uh, we really appreciate the committee's effort to increase the credits. Uh, available to large and relatively undeveloped properties, ourselves included, that, that aren't connected to a, the municipal uh, stormwater mitigation systems specifically. Uh, and so as a tax-exempt entity, you know, we're now brought into the fold in this way, and we understand that, and, and you know, we face our own significant financial challenges, as does the town. and and. Uh, so we've come to preview, review the, uh, this proposed stormwater utility fees uh, more as a payment of lieu in, in lieu of taxes uh, toward the townwide efforts to improve lake water quality, ultimately to improve lake water quality. And, and we uh, recognize that this, should, uh, this effort will, will ultimately benefit every member of, of Shelburne and the greater community. And, and so we've, we... We are in concurrence with the efforts, and, and I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I appreciate them. Any other comments? From the board? From the board? You're opening. Uh, first, uh, I just wanted to compliment the committee. This is a sophisticated, conceptually complicated document that reads very well. And as somebody who has experience with conceptually complicated documents, you always love to read one that reads well and is easy to understand. And I had a lot of questions, but I wanted to look at it a little more. I know we have one more, right? We're going to have another meeting. Yes, two more. Right? Two more. Yeah. Can I, I just wanted to ask a few things, just sort of off the top. First, I thought uh, we aren't uh, allowed to regulate agricultural land at the municipal level. Is that correct? But this sort of incorporates that within the general approach. But it's not really us doing the regulating, it's the state. Is that so, correct? Yeah, the, the theory is that since agriculture can earn its way to a significant credit, it would have to follow the required agricultural practices that Owen just referenced. Those are set forth by the state. So if one can demonstrate they're following those, then they can earn the credit. But we're not regulating and we're not requiring it. We're but they have to come to us with the, with the required evidence that they're following. Is that the idea? Correct. Okay. Um, if somebody wanted to appeal their square footage of impermeable surface area, is that handled through water? Or how, do, how does that actually work? If somebody thought this isn't fair. There there is an appeal process built into the system. So I'm not intimately, I'd have to review it to give okay. it to you, but we will have two more meetings on this. But there is okay. an appeal process built in okay. so that it's not just, here's your number, take it or leave it. We recognize there needs to be some flexibility and some secondary approach to 
and, get it, getting and the numbers right. The last kind of overview, I mean, mm -hmm. I do need to look at this more carefully, was uh, if, uh, uh, if, say, Shelburne Farms is earning credits, would they have to demonstrate on an annual basis that they're continuing to perform those practices to continue to? Okay. All right. Tom, do you want to respond to the question of appeal? And I, I mean, I don't want to. I mean, no, we have, we have okay. time. Okay. That's, That's what a good we're... question. I can brief. Uh, Tom DiPietro with South Burlington. I've been managing the utility there since 2006. Uh, participated in this effort for two years now. I think, yeah. Um, first question, uh, the appeal process is pretty simple at first. Someone says, hey, I think you calculated the square footage wrong. They call, we check it. If it's wrong, we fix it. Um, if they still disagree, then there's a whole appeal process that Lee referenced. I think it would come um, to the select board in this case, or somebody would have to make an appeal, but we can look in the ordinance and get a, a final answer. Uh, and then part two question, I'm sorry, was the little... Um, uh, the credits renewing on an annual basis. Yes, so you have to keep do doing it. it, and you have to maintain it. So if you stop maintaining a stormwater treatment practice, you let your pond fill in with sediment, uh, we'll take a look at that and say, okay, you've just got to do your maintenance, or we're going to revoke your credit. But I guess what's lurking in the back of my mind here is, uh, are we uh, going to, we're going to incur some regulatory costs in verification, right? Oh, we, uh, there are There's a There is an administrative burden to this entire... And is that going to fall to yep. water? Uh, or it's going to fall to... Well, it would be in part billing. This is, this is a serious right. uh, administrative uh, cost. But we also have the so verification component and of it. Monitoring and yeah. verification and field field monitoring. So okay, that was actually a question I was going to... Yeah, it's you know. an ongoing challenge from a staffing perspective. Yeah, right. There's yeah. no doubt about it. I mean, one of Chris's initial budget requests was for a, a staff person yeah. to right. handle this. Right, that's yeah. what I'm um, wondering. So... We acknowledge it's not going to be easy. And also, when uh, so if somebody were to expand, say, uh, build a build out a parking lot, is that going to be um, sort of checked through the DRB process, or are we going to ask water or the uh, utility to also weigh in on zoning issues? There's two ways. If somebody makes changes to a property, uh, we can see them at a DRB level or, you know, site plan approval level, right. make the adjustments to the stormwater billing, or every couple of years you refly the satellite imagery, recalculate the satellite I or see. the impervious surface by parcel, kind of call out the changes and figure out, you know, I what's see. changed. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That's helpful. My reaction, my first early reaction is, uh, uh, again, to thank everybody involved. Uh, we really greatly appreciate the... Uh, not only Lee's leadership, but the staying power of uh, everybody who was on the advisory committee. Uh, this was uh, uh, a, a proposal last year that failed on a number of accounts, and these seem to be addressed, uh, and not only uh, positively, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a condition of, of complete consensus. So we appreciate greatly all of the effort that was involved to, to uh, reach this point. Uh, secondly, uh, I favor the two-tier, as some of you know. I'm glad to see that. Uh, we recognize, obviously, that that uh, is an additional burden in billing and uh, just simply execution of the, of the, of the ordinance, um, but I think to the good, and uh, we uh, are uh, sensitive uh, as a board, uh, as you would expect us to be, to the administrative burden, uh, to the point where we are uh, discussing internally uh, what degree of planning uh, is going to be adequate in advance of, of the re revision, should it be approved, uh, because this is going to be, uh, this will take some considerable adjustment and uh, uh, addition of capacities uh, at the town office level. Uh, my sense is we're going to bear the, the larger proportion of those costs in the first one year. They, they won't be spread equally over three years. We're going to have to make an upfront investment. Uh, so those might be disproportionate in the first year. But that's been a that's been a, a, a concern, and uh, uh, I, we've not had uh, as a board. Uh, a lot of opportunity to absorb this. Uh, we do have uh, uh, 
uh, a plan to continue uh, recess this hearing tonight and continue it uh, in the next two meetings so that uh, the public as well uh, has uh, at least the next week and the week following to read this carefully and come back with questions at our next meeting as there's no doubt we will do ourselves and we invite uh, invite you to make uh, any inquiries that you you feel uh, uh, you, you'd like answers to to uh, Lee and we'll follow up on them would you like to Yes, I'm Carol Carlson. <clears throat> Excuse me, I live on Drew Lane. And um, I just want to clarify for the members of our association, <clears throat> you are having two more discussions of these documents before they're given final approval? That's, that's correct. On the 11th and the second meeting of February. The 11th. So and 20, February 11th, 11 and, and 25 yeah. would be my second. We anticipate <clears throat> a, approval or not on the 25th of February, and there's the next, our next meeting, February 11th, 11th we will have, have again another open hearing. Yes. yes. Okay. As Thank well you. as room for final comments on the 25th. Get this done Thank before you. you're done. Thank you. Gail. <laughs> Just a question in reviewing the budget that you just approved tonight. I noticed that stormwater and public works is down 1%. And how does that accommodate whatever those attending costs might become? Yep. So, good question. The how they are accommodated again, the 206,000 is on the tax base, but it's anticipated that there will be an additional $170,000 of revenue next year from the utility fees. So that's what helps fund the work that's needed. Any other questions? Jerry, can you? Oh, is there anybody else in the public that wanted to make a comment? Do you mind if I say something? No, by all means. Uh, I just wanted to bring up two things. One was uh, regarding the appeal process. I had the exact same question. And... Um, uh, Tom, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I was here the very first time that you presented to the select board before I was on the select board more than six years ago. So it's nice to kind of like see it in, at the end of it and in, in conclusion. So thank you so much and to everyone else on the committee. Um, your comment about how in South Burlington or in other municipalities, if there was an appeal that went beyond a disagreement about the square footage that would go before the select board. So I would just caution the select board, which won't include me, uh, to probably make this a goal um, to have some type of appeal process in place um, before an appeal, because otherwise it'll be the same thing as the taxation appeals. And that hasn't changed for hundreds of years. Um, that's number one. And then the second thing is when we first started talking about this, we actually did talk about um, being able to, to afford credits to homeowners. And I get it that the bigger uh, properties are the, is, are the low uh, lying fruit, but all the residents um, in Shelburne are, you know, all the small pennies that probably uh, make up the bigger percentage overall. And um, I think it's probably too big of a, of a bite to um, take right now, but in the future, it'd be nice to see some type of credit able to be given to people who make that effort. You know, if you have a retention pond that you put in place and you have rain gardens and rain barrels and you do all those things, you are decreasing your um, stormwater contribution for the good of everyone. If everyone did that, it would make a, probably a bigger impact. So that was it. I think uh, I think the, we haven't talked very much about the conservation benefit uh, to this change. Uh, and I, I mean, my sense of it is you're introducing a lot of stakeholders, uh, or you're you're inducing taxpayers to to, to a role of stakeholder. And uh, I think we can feel confident that uh, that, that there's going to be a, 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 a detectable conservation benefit as a result. Would anyone else like to make a I'd just like to say a couple of things. I, I 
served as a liaison to this committee, and they're terrific. We have an embarrassment of expertise and knowledge here on this group. So I, I thank you all for all the time and hours that went into this work product. Um, we should all feel good about being deliberate about this and being okay putting it on the back burner for a little bit and rethinking and considering some of the constituent input, which was really critical to the process. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll receive more input. I think the two-tiered approach was the right approach to take for us. Time will tell whether there are appeals or not. Um, um, beyond that, I, I think you know there can be a misconception with this. It's purely a funding mechanism. It's not a stormwater management ordinance. So I think part of the outreach and communication will just help clarify that a bit. You know, we've had questions in the past around, oh, this is great. We're actually solving the problem and really not. You're just helping address some of the funding around it. So um, I'm hopeful that we'll take this first step and then continue to invest in resources and um, ideas to really help manage our stormwater issue regionally. Um, beyond that, I, I would just say this, um, the ordinance and the manual, um, I feel good about it. It's it's tested. It's South Burlington's model that um, has been in place for a number of years. We've you know iterated on this at some level, but we should um, you know look forward to the additional public hearings. And I think I'll personally put some front porch forum postings out there. Um, if there are other board members, I, I would like us to just engage the community on this to the extent we can because it is a a pretty fundamental change in how we're funding stormwater. Yeah, one of the key concerns raised last time was, was this too closely modeled after the other municipalities or did it really serve Shelburne's mm -hmm. needs? And I think what we've come back with with the committee is a, an approach that does try to meet Shelburne's needs differently than any other community. The, the increases in the credits, the three-year phase-in, the two-tiered approach to residential that only one other municipality has done. So we really did try to tailor this to Shelburne's needs and our property owner's needs. So remind me, on the, <coughs> the budget setting itself, where does that live within our organization? Who's setting, are you, is your department <coughs> setting the budget? Does this board have visibility to that? Is there? That'll, that'll come in the spring. Okay. Yeah. Chris Robinson. Yes, that'll come in the spring um, when we do all the other enterprise funds, so okay. like the water department and the wastewater department. And stuff. So we would have some type of process in place to review that budget? The select board would have visibility to it and that, that's correct. endorse it, so yep. to speak, even though it's yep, your budget? it's got to be voted on by you guys. Budget. Okay. But if, yeah, that's if, oh, sorry. if I remember, I mean, a significant portion of the projects are sort of mandated. Is that correct, Chris? That there are, sorry, I hate to make you keep that note. <laughs> yeah, um, we have flow restoration projects that are mandated um, in order to meet our flow restoration goals. Uh, that's in our MS4 permit. We also now have a phosphorus control plan that we're currently working on with a consultant on establishing that on how we can remove phosphorus from reaching the lake. Um, and those will hopefully not bring up too many additional projects. I'm hoping that we will be able to use the sites with the flow restoration plan and we get you know the biggest bang for the buck because we can do both flow and phosphorus um, so we won't have sites. really any uh, our, our role will really just be to sort of transfer the funds so that those projects are correct dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah I think it might be useful uh, this sort of a technicians put here in terms of the credit manual and given that we're going to have the time at our next meeting it might be useful to have a presentation a brief presentation on that itself uh, especially for those of us who are who are not uh, really not familiar uh, and it's not so much that I have questions about it as much as I think the more exposure and the more discussion of it the better the understanding is going to be uh, this is a question of equity, uh, this revision and this, repose, this proposal. Uh, but you have to think that when you put a cost to a practice uh, that's beneficial in, in the long run to uh, uh, stormwater management, that the stormwater, the stormwater mitigation has to improve. And uh, uh, we're especially grateful for 
the active participation of a number of institutions, not least the farms and the museum, others, the churches, uh, whose role is pretty significant in, uh, uh, in runoff. At the same time, you've stepped up in a very positive, consensual way, uh, as you uh, so eloquently put it, uh, in, an, in lieu of capacity, which uh, we're uh, very appreciative of. Uh, it's, it's nice to see uh, a, uh, a, a equitable distribution of, of, of costs across the entire community in this case. So, uh, and it's not as if we're going to take that as precedent. <laughs> However tempted we might be. So, uh, so we have time, plenty of time, to, to reconsider this next, next meeting, as well as the one following. Again, uh, perhaps speaking for all of us, there's much to absorb here, and uh, it's going to take some careful study. Uh, some of us were here at the time the first proposal was made, and you can, we can do a side-by-side, -side, uh, because there was considerable discussion at that time. And uh, I'm going to assume we see everybody back on the 11th. So purely from a process perspective, just to make sure we follow the dictates of the charter, I think it would be helpful if we <coughs> closed this hearing. So we have a second reading per noted, charter. Noted for the record that the 11th will be the official second reading, yep. but also tonight warn a second hearing for the 25th so we can keep the process moving. We'll do that in one motion? Sure. Are there any further discussions? Any further questions? Hearing none, does someone make that motion? Okay. Move to close the public hearing. We will consider the February 11th meeting the second reading yes. of the ordinance and move to warn a, an additional public hearing on February 25th. 25th. Perfect. Thank you. Jamie moves. I'll second. second. Mike seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Once again, we thank all of you. We greatly appreciate the effort. The next right. item is a request for, as you know, as we noted, for those of you who uh, arrived later, we've uh, flip-flopped uh, 12 and 13. So the next item is a wastewater allocation for request for a single-family home at 104 Mount Philo Road. Yeah, that was a request by Bart Frisbee, and it's all been vetted technically by Chris Robinson, so the ordinance requires your approval of that allocation. Is there a motion to that effect? Move to approve um, wastewater allocation for single-family home at 104 Mount Philo Road uh, and the amount. Do you want an amount? 210 gallons per day. 210 gallons per day. Colleen moves. I'll second. Mike seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes <coughs> have it. Uh, the next item is a, an executive session regarding the town manager's uh, 2019 performance evaluation. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Colleen moves. I'll second. Mike seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approved signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Just to clarify, the motion improves inviting the town manager in. Yes. Okay. With that clarification, is that reason to amend formally, or can we have the understanding that so. the town manager would be present for his evaluation? You want to go into exec session first to discuss before I, I can think come so. in? Yeah. yeah, that's okay. Sure. I sort of anticipated that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Can I don't expect that we'll uh, we'll be a while. We <laughs> we'll won't. come back, but probably formally, simply to adjourn. <laughs>